All right, let's discuss uh, two more kinds of macromolecules, proteins and nucleic acids. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about proteins. Proteins are comprised of C, H, O, and N, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. The monomer is an amino acid, and you will sometimes note AA is um, the abbreviated way to document that you have an amino acid. Uh, long chains of amino acids are how you make a protein. And something that you will need to be, uh, know is that there are only 20 kinds of amino acids and they are bonded together by peptide bonds. So we call them polypeptides. You're gonna discover today that proteins can bend, they twist, they curl, and they even fold in on themselves. Okay, so proteins or polypeptides, uh, let's talk about the six different functions. Function one is storage. So uh, albumin, which is an egg white, you will find that it, that is protein. Uh, they transport, hemoglobin is an example of that. Uh, they're regulatory, so they regulate things like horm uh, hormones would be the example for that. Movement, muscles are made up of protein. Structural, we have membranes, things, uh, proteins make membranes, they make hair, they make your nails. And last but not least, enzymes, and those are responsible for cellular reactions. So I mentioned that we have uh, proteins can bend and fold and that kind of thing. And so we have four different levels of protein structure. Uh, the first one is just a primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary, and quaternary, quaternary. Okay, so our primary structure is where you have amino acids that make a straight chain. So if we look right here, we have amino acid one, two, three, four, five, six. All of these are amino acids. They are uh, noted by the little a, little a. And then you have your peptide bonds, which are this right here. Those are just a single line. Our secondary structures are going to look more 3D and they are coiled and they make what's called pleated sheets. Um, and we hold, those are held together by hydrogen bonds. So you have two kinds, you have the alpha helix, which gives you um, your coils, like a spring, and then you have your beta pleated sheets. And again, these dotted lines, um, they represent your hydrogen bonds. We have a tertiary structure, which is like the secondary structure, it's bent and folded into it. However, you're going to have a much more complex 3D arrangement of polypeptides. Um, it's also gonna have more than just hydrogen bonds. It's gonna have ionic bonds and disulfide bridges. So this crazy structure is your um, protein that looks like a tertiary structure but you can recognize the alpha and the beta. All right, a quaternary structure is gonna be two or more subunits and it's gonna look very globular. Um, you're gonna find it in aqueous environments or environments where water is found and this is what an enzyme will look like. So this is what they're talking about subunits. You saw the tertiary structures a second ago this is going to be two or more tertiary structures. Now that we understand what proteins can look like, let's talk about the two kinds that we have. Uh, we have a structural protein and we have a functional protein. Structural proteins are like collagen. Um, collagen is used to form cartilage and tendons and keratin is used for hair and nails. Um, those are structural proteins. Functional proteins would be things that would transport, and we said hemoglobin is, um, is used to transport. It transports oxygen throughout your body. It's in your blood. 
And enzymes are also, also functional proteins because they are speeding up chemical reactions. All right, so let's test our knowledge and see uh, what we can understand. Which group of macromolecules do enzymes belong to? Proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, or nucleic acids? If you answered A, proteins, you are correct. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about enzymes. Um, and enzymes are a type of protein where um, they have an active site and they fit perfectly with exactly one kind of substrate, as you can see the Amoeba Sisters demonstrates here. Okay, so in talking about enzymes, you need to know that they act as a catalyst, so they're gonna accelerate a reaction. And if activity, um, activity is lost, they stop working if once they are denatured. So we're gonna talk about denaturing um, enzymes Basically, there are certain conditions that will break the enzyme down, and so we call that denaturing. Uh, enzymes are very specific to their job, but the good news is they are reusable. When enzymes are named, all of the enzymes are going to end in this ASE. So if you notice a term and it has ASE behind it, then you should know you're dealing with an enzyme. Um, so sucrase and lipase sucrase reacts with sucrose lipase reacts with lipids um, that identifies that it's an enzyme and that it is reacting with it all right quiz time lipase is an enzyme that reacts with which of the following macromolecules is it an amino acid carbohydrate lipid or nucleic acid if you answered lipid you are correct because lipase ase tells you it's an enzyme, it reacts with lipids, LIP. Okay, so now what we're gonna discuss is exactly how enzymes work. And this is something that you will be expected to understand in, especially since we're gonna be doing some labs with enzymes shortly. So what happens is an enzyme is going to weaken the bond and it's gonna lower the activation energy. So what is the activation energy? That is just the fancy term for saying it's the amount of energy that's needed to complete a reaction. Okay, quiz time. When an enzyme is added, what happens to the amount of energy used? Uh, if you look at the purple line, you'll see that it is without the enzyme, but the pink line is with the enzyme. So, your reaction, um, the progress of the reaction, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna increase, is it gonna decrease, or is it going to stay the same? If you answer decrease, then you are correct, because as you can see here, this graph is much lower than this graph. So the amount of energy required is much less. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the enzyme substrate complex. Uh, the substance, that, which is the reactant, that an enzyme acts on is called the substrate. And um, if you notice, looking at this image here, you see the substrate, it's going to join into the enzyme and it kind of fits perfectly. So it resembles a lock and a key type of combination. In this circumstance, uh, your key is your substrate and your enzyme is your lock. There is a specific area of an enzyme where the substrate can bind and that is called the active site. So the active site is a restricted region um, that is specific to that particular substrate. And if it's not the right substrate, it's not going to bind correctly. And as you can see, it is right here. If the enzyme's active site does not fit the substrate, then something called induced fit can happen. And that's where there is a change in the enzyme's active site, the, the configuration of it, so that uh, the substrate can fit in there. Um, if you look at this image we have, you'll see that the active site doesn't exactly work for our substrate, but 
the substrate pushed itself in there anyways, that is called induced fit. So it's kind of like, I'm going to make it work. You just have to deal with it. There are three things that will affect an enzyme's activity. One is temperature, the other one is pH, and the third one is substrate concentration. Let's look at how temperature can affect enzyme action. Okay, so looking at this graph, you see that the reaction rate increases um, the reaction rate increases as the temperature increases, but the optimal temperature is right here. And it says that that would be 37 degrees Celsius. So that is 98.6, that's your body temperature. So obviously enzymes in your body are gonna be most active at your body temperature. If you have a fever, they're not gonna work as well, or if you are suffering from hypothermia, they're not gonna work as well, and that's gonna cause the enzyme to denature, it's gonna harm it. So if you're sick and you have a high temperature, then as you can see, the reaction rate is gonna be down here. But if you are you know, stuck in a mountain somewhere where you're hiking or whatever you are doing, um, and you have a low temperature, you are also going to have a lower reaction rate. A very similar graph can be seen with pH. Um, you have a decreased reaction rate at a lower pH. So down here, the pH is low, and that means we are dealing uh, with acids, and up here, the pH is high, and we are dealing with bases. And as you can see, um, you have a much lower reaction rate. The optimal pH is seven, which is neutral. So if you have a neutral pH, which happens to be the pH of your blood, um, you're going to have the most effective enzyme action. And the third factor affecting enzymes is substrate concentration. If you have a small amount of substrate, you're not going to have a lot of reaction. But if you have a lot of the substrate coming in, you're going to um, have a faster reaction take place until you reach a point where it doesn't make a difference anymore. Um, so increasing the substrate concentration is going to increase the rate of your reaction. Okay, so let's see what we remember. Sucrase has an optimum temperature of 37 degrees Celsius and an optimum pH of 6.2. What will happen if the pH is made very acidic? So for example, if the pH is four, think back to your graph. Oops. Think back to your graph and it looked like this. So if your pH is right around here, that is optimal, and it's made acidic, it's gonna be down here. If you said that it's gonna denature it, then you are correct. Remember, denature means it breaks apart, it doesn't work. Now that we've covered proteins, let's talk for a second about nucleic acids because they are important. So nucleic acids have uh, one more molecule added to them than um, one more element added to them, uh, to their organic molecule. We have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, we have phosphorus and nitrogen. And there are two types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and the monomer is a nucleotide. So nucleotides are made up of building blocks of three different things. We have a phosphate group, a, nitrog a nitrogenous base, and then we have a sugar. And the way you can remember this is to remember PBS. All right, so phosphate, base, sugar. Um, RNA, it has A, T, no, RNA has A, U, C, and G. Okay, it has uracil. And DNA has A, T, C, and G. Um, sugar is also different between RNA and DNA. 
DNA has deoxyribose and RNA has ribose. And what you'll discover is that the deoxy, that just means you are missing your minus one oxygen. Okay, so let's talk briefly about the functions of DNA and RNA. When we get into genetics and heredity, we're gonna talk tons about DNA and RNA, but just the basics that you need to understand right now is that DNA is a double helix. So you've got one, two sides. RNA, you have one side. Um, DNA is gonna store genetic information. It has two interlocking strands. So like I said, you have strand number one here, strand number two there. Um, and it's a double helix, it's a spiral staircase. So basically, if you were to draw a DNA molecule, if you make one, which we will make, you draw a ladder basically, and then you twist it. And um, the rungs, make that double helix spiral staircase look. For RNA, you are, RNA is used to produce proteins and it is single stranded. So what happens is it's gonna carry a message. Um, it carries a message from a part of DNA. All right, so that's everything. We have reached the end. We're gonna go into more detail later um, about proteins and uh, DNA and nucleotides, but for now, this is what you will be expected to know for the assessment.